and me and the other lightning talks, we're going to show you something new. You see, I am Larry Hastings, and I'd like to say hello to the black, to the white, the red, and the brown, to the purple and yellow. But first, I've got a, a bang, bang, a boogie to the woogie, say up, jump the boogie to the bang, bang, boogie, let's rock. And you don't stop, rock the knowledge that'll make your python rock. Well, so far, you've heard my voice, but it's time for me to go. And next on the mic, another lightning talk. So come on, we're going to start the show. Gentlemen, Larry Hastings, thank you very much indeed. And as they say in show business, follow that. <laughs> so, yeah, you know the rules. Lightning talks no more than five minutes. So remember that greater than or equals to sign. Uh, if it goes over that, if it's equals to is okay, greater than is not. Uh, the Python secret underground have been contracted to deal with anyone that goes over their allocated time. So be careful. So first up, we have Matthew Desmarais. Thank you very much. I, next speaker up is Christian Dovsky. Am I seriously supposed to follow that? That, that was insane. Um, all right, so um, I'm here tonight to talk to you about uh, this tool called Instrumental. And to do that, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about coverage.py. I'm going to talk a little bit about st uh, structural coverage basics. And then I'm going to talk about Instrumental itself. So uh, how many people in the room uh, used coverage.py? Yeah, there's a lot of you. So you know what I'm talking about when I, uh, I'll say that coverage by uh, measures statement coverage and it measures branch coverage. Statement coverage is when it tells you if you executed a statement, uh, let's say during your test run. Uh, branch coverage is when it tells you if you uh, went a certain way with a branch uh, during your test run. Um, and that's basic structural coverage stuff. And it gives you a good sense for, ooh, I, got, I have slides. Sorry. Um, <laughs> So uh, um, it gives you a good sense for what it is, what you have and haven't executed, which is good during tests. Um, it tells you if your tests are any good. And also with Python, we know that if we haven't executed something, there's no telling what's going to happen. It could go boom. Um, so you want to be sure that you execute everything. Uh, but the problem is programs are more than just statements and branches. Uh, programs have uh, other things in them, like uh, conditions and decisions. I'm going to throw a couple definitions at you. A condition we'll call uh, leaf-level Boolean an expression that can't be broken down any further. A decision we're going to call a Boolean expression uh, composed of conditions and zero or more Boolean operators. So what does that actually mean? Um, a decision can be A, and that's it just holds the one condition there, or a decision could be A and B or C, right? And we can see these things in, our, in tests for if statements and, and while loops and things like that. Um, so... Um, so consider that second case. Consider the A and the B or C, right? Um, I'm going to say that there are five sig significant cases there. There's the true, true, uh, true, true, false, true, false, false, and, and so on down the list. And uh, I'm going to say that these are significant cases because they isolate the effects of certain inputs, uh, sort of truthiness on the result of the decision. Um, and this is where branch coverage isn't enough. Because let's say we have this in the, the test for an if statement. Um, you could achieve branch coverage just by going true and false, and you have these other three, and that only covers two cases. You could have these other three cases up there um, that presumably mean something because you uh, you included them in your program, at least the, the possibility that they would occur in your program. Um, you expect to handle them, so you want to be sure that uh, you want to be sure that you cover them, and that's where instrumental comes in. Uh, instrumental measures the executions of conditions and decisions. Uh, I just want to show you how you run instrumental. It's it's command line tool. Uh, uh, like coverage.py, uh, you run it uh, with the instrumental command. Uh, you can give it a, a dash T. Uh, it says target the pyramid package, for example. Uh, or you could say dash I, uh, ignore pyramid.tests. And this is controlling what you're going to get output on. Uh, and then dash R says give me a report detailing missed coverage. And you see down there at the end, this is going to have to be a, um, the path to a Python script that it's going to execute. It's basically going to take the place of the Python executable. And when we run that, we're going to get a results table that's going to look something like this. Um, you can see that what this says uh, is that on uh, line 31 of the pyramid.view module, um, you can see that we went true, 
but not false. And this is actually about what you'd get from branch coverage, right? Uh, the, the second one, uh, the logical or that's on pyramid.view line 281, uh, you can see that we only hit the true, uh, the true and then something else case. Uh, so the second pin is never executed there. Um, this is really where instrumental strength comes in because now we can see that we haven't hit the false true case and we haven't hit the false false case that we can say are um, important cases for, uh, for testing this, this OR gate, right? Um, also, instrumental does more than control flow, not just uh, if statements. Uh, think about something like uh, like this, this debug and self.log node this. Uh, you can see that sort of thing just sort of naked in a program, and uh, instrumental will pick up on that. Uh, a couple neat things it does. Instrumental doesn't expect you to hit cases that are impossible because of literals, like you see this foo equals bar or an empty dictionary. Um, you can mark infeasible conditions as unexecutable using this no con syntax, which is fouled up on the slide. Um, and uh, Oh yeah, the, I have included a, a, node, a nose plugin so it can tell you uh, which case hit each condition. It'll give you a listing of which case he hit each condition. Um, additionally, these are some things that uh, Instrumental will do now and I'm committed to supporting in the future. And let's see. Uh, for more information, it's, uh, it's up here on the slide. You can see the documentation on Read the Docs, uh, codes in Bitbucket. Uh, I'm Desmage. And I want to thank uh, General Digital, the place that I worked that first showed me this kind of thing, and Ned for coverage.py because it's freaking awesome. Yeah. So use instrumental with coverage.py. Great. Thanks very much indeed. Okay. So next speaker for setup is Kay Adams at geek.net. Thanks. And now we're going to hear from Christian Dovsky. Yeah. Hi. So I want to tell you about a library that I wrote called StatVent that will hopefully give you better application visibility. So um, basically, in a nutshell, so you can either tune out or keep listening, um, it writes out application stats to a named pipe that you can uh, consume and do whatever you want with the stats. So think like uh, proc FS for your application. Um, so I work for a company called Bump. We write Android and iOS apps. We have a lot of back-end services that those applications talk to and that talk amongst each other, and many of them are written in Python. Uh, usually we want to know what they're doing. They're, you know, headless server applications, but we want some visibility into what they're doing. So, you know, there's different ways we can get that. Uh, we can do logging, which we do, and logging is fine for some types of information. Um, we can do profiling. I actually went to a great talk today on profiling um, and talking about running profiling in production. So that was kind of a an interesting idea. Occasionally, we'll spin up a, an application node with C profile enabled to get an idea of you know performance and stuff. But never thought of running it all the time. But that's cool. Um, so what we typically do is we record stats about you know various important aspects of our applications. Um, the typically we're interested in counters. How often is this operation happening? Um, it's pretty basic, you know plus equals one, effectively. Um, sometimes we want to know, you know, for requests or for latency, you know, how long something takes, and, you know, broken down by various percentiles. So we will, uh, we'll, we're interested in that as well. Um, so, so StatVent gives you a pretty simple API as a developer. Um, increment, set, and record. You can name your stats whatever you want. I've got a few examples up there. App.request, app.connections, app.latency. Um, increment, increments. Set just to you know sets that value specifically for that moment, and record uh, tracks a number of values, and that's where we do the per, uh, the percentile rollups. Uh, deployer API is very simple. It's a single function. It starts up a background thread that writes to the named pipe. Um, the named pipe is written lazily, so the thread fires up and it sits there blocking until something decides to read from that name pipe. And when it reads from it, then that's when this data is written. So it's pretty efficient. Um, the consumer API, you guys have used cat, right? So you do cat temp stats pipe process ID dot stats and you will get some output. Um, you can also use watch if you want to see stuff live. And there's also a little JSON web service that collects all the stats from all the name pipes on your, on your machine and dumps them in JSON. For humans, uh, you can do whatever you want with it. Store in a database, make it queryable, make pretty graphs. There's one. Maybe not so pretty, but it's a graph. Uh, so here's a quick demo. So here is an example program. All it does is write stats and sleep. 
but I am going to show you what that looks like. Here is watch. Oh, <laughs> denied. <laughs> wow, ouch. Oh, wait, 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 I'm missing my cat, thank you. There we go. Stats, and look at them. See, they're incrementing and moving. And <laughs> but wait, there's more. So here's the, here's the little JSON web service. It uses base HTTP server, Go standard library. And then you can hit it with curl, and there are JSON stats. So you can hit that periodically and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's it for the live demo. Um, this is it. There's the GitHub <laughs> URL as most projects probably will have. Uh, there's a nascent C API if you have software written in C and you want to uh, use this same, you know, basically the same API. So there's a set, there's an anchor. There's not record in the C API right now. It's nascent. Um, but it writes out to a name pipe as well using a dedicated thread, same idea. Uh, runs on Linux and OS 10. It's not on PyPy yet. So just get it from GitHub for now. But um, if anyone's interested in Windows support, I don't even know how you would do that. Maybe it's possible. <laughs> but I think it would be cool. I would like it to see it supported elsewhere. And I'll get it on PyPy. I will. I will. Uh, that's, all, that's all I've got. Thank you. Thanks very much, Christian. So next speaker to set up is Paul Tag at sunlightfoundation.com. Great. And now we're going to hear about a new project called Switchboard from Kyle Adams. All right, so a year ago, my first PyCon, uh, I sat out there and watched uh, David Kramer give a lightning talk on Gargoyle, which was a feature flipper that Discuss used for their Django apps. And at the time, I leaned over to a colleague of mine and I said, we need that. Uh, so here I am back a year later, and I'm happy to report that we actually have that. Switchboard is a port of Gargoyle, uh, initially to Turbo Gears, but I suspect uh, I will be able to get it to run on uh, pylons in Pyramid without much uh, change to it, and I'd like to get it running on Flask as well. So I like to think of it as the feature flipper for those of us uh, who are not using Django. So yes, 2012 is demoed. Uh, we've been using Switchboard in production at SourceForge uh, since October of 2012. So it's got a lot of uh, good hard production mileage on it. There's nothing quite like uh, several million hits a day to iron out bugs. Uh, and so that brings us to today. And let me show you a little bit about what Switchboard can do. So this is the admin UI. It's pretty simple. Uh, but when you add a switch, to a web page, uh, which I have several switches on this page, you can uh, have it automatically create the switches. So you can see I just reloaded the page and it showed up with the switches that were embedded in that page. Uh, each switch has a status. By default, when it automatically creates a switch, it uh, sets it to a disabled status, which is the, the red icon next to it. I can set a uh, status to selective. And when you have a uh, switch that's in selective status, that's when things really start to get interesting because you can put conditions on a switch. Uh, conditions can be th things like uh, a certain percentage of users visiting the site would see the switch active. Uh, you can have it only active for admin users. Uh, and in this case, we're going to have it triggered by a special query string. So there I have my switch set up. And now if I go back to my page, I can add that uh, string to my query string. And you can see the page loads up with a completely different looking design. So this is very useful for when you're making major changes to the site to be able to push those changes into production, preview them live in production, maybe do stuff like A-B testing uh, without the risk of uh, mucking up your code with all these if statements. So in addition to the selective status, uh, let's say that I want to take that 
new design live, then I can set it active for everyone. It's a global status. And I'll check to make sure that uh, I actually want to do that. And you can see that my status is now green. That means that that switch is now active. And even if we remove this, uh, the, the new design is still in place. So that is a quick demo of Switchboard. And again, this was a, uh, a port of uh, Gargoyle from Django to Turbo Gears. And I'm going to be working on it more at the Allura Sprint. Uh, so if you stick around for the code sprints and you want to uh, learn more about this, feel free to, to swing by the Allura Sprint. We're actually going to be adding it to Allura. Allura is the open source Python platform that's powering the new SourceForge. And we'd love to talk with you about it. It is on PyPy, uh, and it is also on SourceForge. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kyle. OK, next speaker for setup, Lucas Z at Langadopil. Great. OK, so now we're going to hear about a new project called Hi, which is a Lisp variant from Paul Tag. Ready? All right. Hey, guys. So I'm Paul. Uh, I wrote a list because I got a lot of free time. Um, so either be horrified or laugh or like throw up or something, whatever, whatever gets you through the night. So here's, here's, an, here's an example of a high expression. Looks like any other list, right? Uh, except I built in a couple of other things. Uh, so if I import OS and I print OS, uh, suddenly we've imported Python. And what do you know? This looks a whole lot like Python. And so if I do maybe abs path, on OS path. Uh, oh no, we need to say current directory. Uh, like suddenly we're, we have full access to Python uh, from inside Lisp because this is a front end like LLVM or GCC that compiles instead of bytecode uh, to Python AST. Um, so this Lisp compiles entirely to Python. Uh, <laughs> yes, oh man. <laughs> Um, in addition, here, I was able to generate Python code off the ASD. So this is what it sort of looks like, right? So here's a Lisp script on the left, and here's the outputted Python from the AST module. Uh, and it looks pretty sane. It's pretty amazing. Um, and so I can on the fly maybe do something like, oh, where am I? So plus one, two, three. Uh, and suddenly, uh, we get the Pythonic plus one, two, three. Um, and then print plus one, two, three, right? So we have access to all of Python's internals here. Everything works. It's magic. It's great. I use pep302 uh, to basically do import hooks to search sys.path for .hi files instead of .py files and then shove it into sys modules as compiled bytecode and no one ever know, right? Uh, <laughs> And so if we look over here, right, I have this uh, right here, maths.py, which is a couple of Lisp functions here. And on the right, I can open up a Python shell. I can import hi, and then import maths, and then help maths. Uh, and we have doc strings and everything. Uh, <laughs> yes, this is awesome. <laughs> Now, if that wasn't enough, I continued having way too much time. Uh, so inside this debug, I'm invoking it. So we can see that I'm inside the Python scripts right now. Uh, I want to step into that. And suddenly, we're stepping in through Lisp. <laughs> So we've altered x mid scope and it's returned a different value because of what we've done. Uh, so not only do you have access to it and can you step through it, you can also alter and programmatically deal with the uh, the local scope because it does compile directly to Python. Um, so if we take that out and use something like PUDB in case anything debug.py. Oh, shoot. Yep, we can we can step through on there as well and we can start to see how it's actually going through the Lisp code. <laughs> Yes, this is horrible. Come on. <laughs> oh, yeah, and that like little REPL thing that you saw earlier, uh, completely written in high itself as a Flask app. I've written Django apps. I've written Flask apps. Everything. It's crazy. It's completely compatible. Um, <laughs> So if you hook this up with PyPy, you have a Lisp 1 variant that's effectively capable of doing real-time video processing. Yeah. 
Wow. Wow. Thanks very much indeed, Paul. <laughs> Why are you thanking me? <laughs> because it's nice to see what an imagination can bring you. Okay, so the next speaker up for setup would be John Costa. Thank you, John. And now we're going to hear from Lucas Langer about five Python packages you need to know. Uh, well, hello. So um, I'd like you to know five Python packages. Uh, I'm Lukas Langa. I can be reached uh, by those um, yeah places in the internet. But I have 52 slides, so let's get better get on with it. So the first package is called First. Um, Python is a cool language. You can uh, use those if statements uh, in a way that doesn't involve equals false, equals true. You can even use them with uh, um, other falsy values, truthy values, stuff like lists and stuff. But sometimes um, you do uh, have lists having falsy values. You don't. You don't want to uh, them be considered as truthy. So there's this wonderful any built-in. Unfortunately, it doesn't return an any value, it returns a boolean value. If you need the first value that is truthy, that's where first comes in. Um, why would you need it? Because, for instance, you have this nested uh, regular expression structure, which looks like this using first. Better? Better. Right. So the second um, package, it's called, pop it's called pass. This is the old formatting um, ma machinery we are using in Python. Cool, but there's a new, uh, a new one with a completely new language which nobody does really remember. So yeah, um, but still, it, it is there. We use it, and there's this pass module which does the magic of doing the exact opposite thing. So you can actually um, get results from an already concrete string, which is cool. Let's go uh, to the third package. It's actually in this uh, standard library. I didn't know about it for so long, and actually I'm a core contributor, so it's cool. For instance, <laughs> we have this um, directory structure. We can compare files and see whether they are uh, the same or not. Um, we can even compare whole directories, so we get full reports on whether they are, um, yeah, they are alike or not alike. This is how it will, looks like when they are just the same. Um, but when we are comparing directories, it actually uh, makes me wonder about whether we can do something with stuff like this. I'm not sure whether you ever saw images like these. I saw, and it breaks my heart, because uh, data actually decays on your hard drives. So uh, I wrote a tool that actually um, helps with um, seeing whether that's the case on your hard drive, and you're not using ZFS, because Steve said no. So OK, uh, we have BitRot. Um, um, we run it, and it says, okay, there's um, a couple of files in the directory structure, and it creates a small SQLite database with all the hashes and modification creation dates, stuff like that, which lets me check whether anything changed. Here, nothing changed. Great. But if somebody ch uh, something changed because uh, we moved some files, uh, yeah, we delay deleted some files and altered all uh, others, it automatically uh, updates the database. Base. But if the file changed and the stat on the files didn't, because for instance uh, the modification date stays the same, but the content isn't the same, um, then it reports an error. So you know that your data is corrupted and you g uh, need to go to your time machine to get your data back. Docopt. Uh, this is another um, insane library, which is I like it. I wrote a tool um, the other day um, for renaming with regular expressions. I'm, um, I don't think you should really read it, but this is the output of the uh, dash dash help. I implemented that with arc pass. Uh, the implementation looks like this. It's like 50 lines. Uh, yeah, seriously. So I wrote another tool. It's a simple HTTP proxy, and the implementation of this uh, dash dash help looks like this. Uh, I'm not sure whether you, you've seen it, but actually, all it takes for you is to write a reasonable uh, doc string, and
and run this. Terrific. Insane. Works. So, um, how many packages were there? Five. So let me go with six. Um, by, um, year 2013 is the year of Python 3. So you can, uh, so you should actually port all your libra libraries to Python 3. Um, it's really easy. So test, test with 2.7, test with 3.3. Uh, uh, it provides you with all the stuff that really is needed to uh, provide both versions. Oh, so close! Yes. Congratulations, Lucas Langer. Well done, man. Okay, so next speaker for setup would be A Swiger. A Swiger. Do we have A Swigert in the house? A Swigert at gmail.com. Okay, guess his slot's gone. Leah Silent 2. Okay. Fine, so next we are going to hear from Solomon Hikes about the future of Linux containers. Hey everyone, does this mean I have 10 minutes? I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'm, I'm Solomon. I work at DotCloud. Um, so we're a platform as a service provider. We, we deploy people's web apps and databases, make sure they stay scaled and take care of complicated things like failover, uh, monitoring, etc. And um, I want to talk about Linux containers because that's what we use um, you know, under the hood. And I would say for one hacker who comes to us and say, hey, here's my web app, run it for me, and I want to take care of it, another hacker comes to us and say, hey, actually, uh, this sounds really cool. I don't want to give you guys any money. I want to do it myself. How do you do it? And we say, Linux containers is this open source thing. And they're like, okay, thanks. They go check it out. And then you know, the next day they come back, they're like, yeah, that sounds really hard, actually. You know, could you give me like that low-level piece you guys use to do this magical thing? Uh, and we say, no. Uh, not, <laughs> not because we don't want to, because uh, DocLot is actually this pretty complicated platform behind the scenes. There's a hundred or so quadruple extra large instances, which we break down into Linux containers. We move those containers around. Um, and so it's very tight to the way we do things, the way, you're, you know, the way we build your web app, the way we do load balancing, all sorts of things. Um, but we always thought it would be cool to be able to say yes, to be able to say, here's our low-level piece, you can do Linux containers with this, and go build you know, whatever you want, build your platform. Uh, and so that's what we're doing. Uh, oh, this is a little drawing I put in, because that's really what containers are. They are self-contained units of software that you can deliver on a server over there, a server over here, from your laptop to EC2 to your bare metal giant mega server. It'll run the same way, right? Because it's isolated at the process level, uh, it has it, and it has its own file system. So we've been working on open sourcing that, and we haven't shown it to anyone. We're going to probably announce it, you know, open the floodgates in a, in a couple of weeks. We have a few people from the outside, 40 or so people outside of .cloud playing with it already. And I thought, hey, why not give a little sneak peek here? So this is actually the first time we show anything outside of the .cloud office. So it's probably going to blow up on me. Uh, but anyway, if you're interested, uh, probably I'm going to get cut short before the end. So just come see me. We'll be in the, in the lobby over there. So what Docker does, it's, it's a little demon you drop on the server, any server that has a Linux, uh, a Linux kernel that's modern enough. And it runs processes for you, but it runs them in a way that they're super isolated like I described. So the first thing you can do, can you guys read this? All right, so I can check if anything's running, and nothing's running. Um, and then I, can, I want to run something, so this is really confusing. Um, the way it works is you run a command, like, you know, uh, echo hello world, except you want to run it in something because you want that container run to be repeatable, so you start from a known file system state. You start from a file system image. So I'm missing something here. First, I need to check what images I have. I have two images. One's called base, and that's like a standard uh, Ubuntu base image. And one is BusyBox. If you guys know that, it's a really, really tiny uh, image, which I downloaded from a tarball. Uh, so if I want to run uh, echo hello world in BusyBox, and I want, by default, it'll run in the background. So I'll just say dash A attach. So what had just happened here is it generated a new LXE container, allocated a new file system, file system for it, mounted a rewrite layer, allocated a network interface, set an IP for it, set up NATing for it, uh, and then executed a process in there, captured its output, and printed it to me. So that was all. <laughs> I can do it a bunch of times. Uh, 
So each of those hello worlds actually runs in this container as described. Um, obviously, nothing's running because it exited, but there's a history of everything that has been run. You can see I've been playing a lot. Um, and you can also do this for long-running demons, right? So for example, uh, introducing the lamest demon in the world. Does this work? Should work. I'm, all right, and I'm going to run this in the f background, right? So it gives me a unique ID for this container, uh, which I can then, you know, I can check if it's running. Okay, it seems to be running. I apologize, the, the screen's a little too small. And I can say, hey, what's the output of this process over there so far? Oh, it looks like it's saying, oh, wow. Looks like I can't spell. But other than that, <laughs> it's doing interesting stuff, right? Um, I can attach to it in real time. Uh, and I'm out of time, so I'm going to have to continue the demo if someone's interested. Attach it in real time, it'll stream it to me, all the, all the things you'd expect. Uh, and I didn't get to the point where you can see live the changes to the file system as stuff happens, and then checkpoint that into a new image within seconds, and then run a new process, which you can then automate, so you can script things like building an application, right? That would be build a process, snapshot, build, run Thank another process. You. Anyway, I'm done. Very much. <laughs> Solomon Hikes. Solomon Hikes, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Solomon. Okay, for ne next for setup with Preston, uh, PT1. Oh. Preston, where are you? <sighs> Signing up for slots and then not coming to fill them. Let's say, oh, you are. Good. Excellent. Oh, this looks interesting. <laughs> not, not actually that the rest of the talks haven't been interesting. <laughs> Seen some amazing stuff so far. So I think everyone's doing the best to follow Larry Hastings' introduction. Okay, so next we are going to hear from Andy Terrell and Anthony Skopatz, Skopatz about SciPy 2013. Go, guys. Hi, PyCon. Welcome. We're, uh, thanks for letting us speak. We're going to tell you about the second greatest Python conference in the world, uh, SciPy. My name's Andy Terrell, and I run tsunamis. Uh, and I'm Anthony Skopatz, and I blow things up with lasers. So. Um, so, SciPy, uh, SciPy 2013, it's in June. Uh, it's really a conference to talk about all of these packages and more. Um, all of the scientific software ecosystem, right? So, NumPy, uh, SciPy, IPython, PyTables, and your packages as well, if you have them, and would like to come to SciPy and speak. So what are we doing? We're doing science in Python and creating awesome. We want to make sure that you know that if you do science, you're welcome. If you do Python, you're welcome. And if you're awesome, you're welcome. Everybody can come. We're, we're, this is our 12th year. We do model our conference after PyCon. We follow a lot of the things we, you guys are already doing with diversity statements and lightning talks and things like that. Austin, Texas is a great place. And my three important points is great beer, warm summers, unfortunately, no beach. Um, so this year, I'd just like to present what our topics are. So we have mi two main tracks uh, in, in parallel with the general session. So the first one is reproducibility, which you know you might take as a given from from science, but I assure you, it is not. Um, <laughs> And then to that end, our, our other main track is machine learning, uh, because clearly the scientists aren't doing their jobs. Right. Um, and then we have a number of mini symposia as well on meteorology, climatology, uh, astronomy and astrophysics, bioinformatics, med medical imaging. And if you're um, interested, we would love to have you come give a ball for, or help organize a mini symposia as well. Come join us. You can speak. You can present a poster. You can sprint. You can go to tutorials. Everybody's welcome to join us. Don't worry. If you don't do science well, we don't code well. <laughs> Come, let us learn together. Um, yeah, and to note, the abstract submission for speaking is on Wednesday, so please make sure to get your abstracts in. It's only 150 words, people. Um, and then, finally, uh, I'd like to give a big round of applause to our current sponsors and uh, wish for uh, more in the future, too. So, thanks. Okay, thanks very much, guys. Andy Terrell and Andy Anthony Skopatz. So we've got a hardware-oriented project coming up now. But before we do, next person up for setup, could we hear from PyCon at roncox.org?
Yep, okay, we'll defer that. Okay, in which case we're on to the secondary speakers now. You'll notice I am trying to move them through because amusing as I am, lightning talks are much more amusing. Jesse Lovelace, please. Are you here? <gasps> Don't say we're going to run out of speakers. You can do it. Excuse me? At gmail.com. Well, we can sort that out. It's you, is it? Okay. <laughs> Probably works for the CIA. Okay, so while our spy sets up, we're going to hear from Preston Holmes about a project called Birdfish. All right, so um, I'm going to just quickly talk about a kind of crazy side project I've had off and on for a couple of years. And what this is is a, a tool to allow somebody to express an artistic idea on LED lighting. Um, and I think we all find that uh, lights can be magical and sparkly and we're all mesmerized. And there's a whole secret corner of the internet. If you open one door, you'll find there's like the whole world of people who get really obsessed about uh, these. <laughs> and they're really driving some innovation in the hardware. And, uh, but they don't, they don't do something that just looks like this, they do stuff that looks like this. Alright, so that... People spend a lot of time having fun with this, and there's been a change though in the last couple of years, and what it is is the way people used to set this up is they'd have this Windows PC and they'd have a USB dongle that went out to uh, a lighting protocol DMX, which is what people use on like stage shows, etc. And, and people would build these boards, these, these uh, do-it-yourself boards that would control your high voltage AC light and work with regular Christmas lights. And each of those sort of controller boards could handle about 16 channels. And so you could cover your whole house with like maybe 25 light strings of lights and, and get one of those kind of shows put together. And the software would look something like this and the way they'd handle it is that each channel is a row and for each you know string of lights and then you just take time and slice it up into a bunch of columns and you have a big grid and you can you know, do fades by doing those little triangular ramp downs, etc. And, uh, and it was super cool and people have fun. And then China started putting out these really cool LED modules. And what these do is they allow each light in a string or a strip, etc. to be individually addressable and addressable as an RGB. So that's three channels. So now you have a string of lights which used to be one channel with maybe 100 lights on it, and now it's 300 channels. So the approach of using a grid is seriously strained if you're dealing with thousands and thousands of channels. So I wanted to, um, so this is sort of the current hardware setup now, and what I wanted to do was write a Python library that abstracted away all of the details. So you want to basically invent a, a swoosh or a color fade, et cetera, and you don't want to worry about what a R, a G, and a B channel value is at 40 times a second. You just want to be able to design in your code, I want this to fade out over two seconds, and I want it to sort of move across a strip and change from red to blue, and I want to just be able to trigger that. Um, and I don't want to worry about maintaining the state of all of those values over time. So uh, the library is called Birdfish, which uh, I don't know if anyone gets the reference. It's sort of from the Island of Misfit Toys. But the, um, there's sort of the three layers. It takes inputs, which essentially are just trigger events, like on or off. And then the elements themselves handle all of the rendering and management of the channel output. And the output, for the most part, is this uh, Ethernet-based version of DMX. Um, so I'm going to do a quick little demo here. We have this up and running, I believe. So for those of you that can see, basically what's happening is that 40 times a second, each of those lights is being sort of modeled in Python code, and the Python code is determining how bright it should be, what color it should be, how it should fade out. And, and all I'm doing is sort of pressing one key on my keyboard and the library is generating the rest of it. And the input can be a MIDI keyboard or it could be a touch screen. Oh, there's a protocol called OSC. And so you can do, you know, lots of different sparkly things and 
have things glow and blink and you know the idea is the the conceptual idea was to have something that was like a choreographer gives instructions to dancers and the choreographer doesn't worry about you know flex your trapezius muscle by 25 percent and raise your elbow by 2.5 degrees and and that's what i that's the vision i have of you with your muscles twitching but the idea is you want to be able to have an idea, write it out in relatively simple Python code, and just and make it happen. So, that's all. Well, <clears throat> Preston Holmes, ladies and gentlemen. Brilliant, wonderful piece of hardware. Okay, so next up to set up is Jesse Lovelace. Actually, Robert Myers. Oh, I beg your pardon, right. So that's why, I, that's why I didn't see you on my list. I was about to call the bouncers. Okay, Martin Von Lewis, if you'd like to set up next, please. I think at this stage we will have to declare we've got time for two more talks. So that will mean that we're also going to be hearing, if he's here, from kpi at google.com. Google is kpi here? Okay, well, if KPI is not here, we want to hear from Terry Simons. Okay, Terry, if you'd like to set up later, you're, you're, you'll be tonight's final speaker. Great. So, now we're going to hear from Robert Myers about Julython. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Robert Myers. Uh, I run a little site called Julython.org. Um, it's a site to uh, gamify uh, open source contributing. So why did I build it? Uh, if you're like me, uh, you like open source and you want to contribute to either an existing project or yeah, share your code. Um, but there are too many distractions in your life. Uh, your real job, uh, significant others, kids, beer. <laughs> So working on open source projects is, doesn't take a high priority in your life. Uh, so one of the solutions to that is to create a deadline. You need a deadline to help you get focused on getting your, your solution out. So they're a great motivational tool to finish a project. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could create an artificial deadline for your project and also have a little healthy competition uh, between your fellow projects, friends, or uh, enemies? Uh, <laughs> so that's why we built Julython. Uh, basically, it's a month-long sprint uh, for any project can join. All you do is add a webhook uh, to your GitHub project or Bitbucket. Um, and you get you score points by committing, and every commit is worth a point, and every new project that you add is worth ten points. And then you can join teams and locations to uh, combine your scores with other developers in either those areas or the teams, and then compete, make some open source projects, make stuff happen. Uh, so it's about. That's about all I have. It's a really short talk. Um, I do have, uh, as you can contact me on, on Twitter, the Julython, and help at Julython.org. And also, I made some t-shirts, but I only have two. So I'm going to throw these out, and you guys are going to have to share. <laughs> so let's see. I'll, throw, I'll probably try to throw in one. I'm going to try and throw them out here. Let's see what I can do. Would you, Front row's closer. Would you, would you like a rubber band for the next one? Does anyone have a rubber band? Maybe we could wad it up. You need to pretty much wad it up, wrap it up in a sock. I think we might get the second row this time. <laughs> oh, good one. Yeah, yeah. All right. Congratulations to our winners. Robert Myers, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much, Robert. Okay, so if you'd like to come up and set up next, we're going to hear from Martin Von Lewis, an amazing contributor to Python for many, many years, director of the Python Software Foundation, and yet has retained his sanity, <laughs> maintainer of the Windows installer, for which alone he deserves a medal. Windows is by far... <laughs> Thank 
And like me, he has retained his sanity sufficiently to not be standing for the board this year. So, congratulations. I now officially describe myself as the escaped chairman of the Python Software Foundation. So, uh, Martin is going to talk to us about the Common Locale Data Repository. Thank you. Um, this is actually a project I just started, so it's not really uh, usable yet, but instead I'm asking people to contrib contribute. Uh, the CLDR is a Unicode consortium project these days uh, collecting data about regional information, for example, what is the Icelandic name of Great Britain, and the answer is Bretland, um, or what is the Izmir uh, uppercased in Turkish, and you know, notice that the title case of a small i is not a capital I, but a capital I with a dot, but only if, if you uppercase for Turkish. Um, and many more information. And the way I want to approach this is that, there sh uh, that I'm developing a locale module that reads all this data. And it has two levels of API. The lower level gives access to all data, but you have to know what uh, the way in which it is structured. So, for example, to answer the question what the name of uh, Great Britain is, you uh, look up in a dictionary that is called territories asking for the country code of Great Britain and you get the localized answer. Um, on top of that, there will be, but currently is not, an API to do um, number formatting, uh, casing, collation, and, and uh, all these other f uh, functions, uh, algorithms that are implementable on top of these local data. Um, this will be an object API uh, different from the current locale module, which is the global variable. Um, and in addition, there, I, I think there should also be a thread local way of setting the locale for a piece of code uh, as a context. Um, People might ask why I'm not using PyICU. ICU is a standard C++ library that accesses the CLDR. Or why I'm not using Babel or some other libraries that have tried the same thing. Um, my objective is that I want to get complete access to CLDR and even ICU doesn't give all information that is in the database. And when looking into this CLDR, I found that it has mistakes, information that is just incorrect for German, for example, or for any probably many other tiny mistakes. And so you want to do database updates without code updates, and therefore the existing libraries won't really work. Um, yeah, the status is that, that it's, I just started my long-term view of this project is that I eventually want to propose it as, as a standard library locale module. Um, essentially, mostly replacing the existing locale module, which uh, would give the advantage that it has the same data on all platforms. So the, currently the, the Windows locale and the Unix locale often have different locale names, different data per locale. And it would also allow to have multiple locales loaded simultaneously. Um, as I said, it's just started and I appreciate contributions. Thank you for your attention. Martin, Martin von Lewis, ladies and gentlemen. So, our final speaker tonight oh, is going to be talking... Oh, this looks interesting. This looks very interesting indeed. So, what's it called, Terry? So, um, a couple oh, of okay, this is... I beg your pardon. We'll just let you go, right? Time are ready. This is Terry Simons, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was an interesting uh, Kickstarter project uh, that I found out about called Spine. And... Um, it's basically a 2D um, skeletal animation package for gamer for game development. So um, this is Spine. It's not written in Python, but um, I actually what I did was I, I ported the runtime to Python. So I'll show you that in just a minute. But um, this is the animation, um, and then you can do things like you know take away the eyes and stuff, whatever. <laughs> um, just to you know, so you can see that all the images are separate and it's all being uh, compiled and, and run on the fly. So I'll show you one more animation here. Um, you can change the animation. Uh, I don't actually have the right number there. Let's do 40. 
so you can see that. Um, so, so that's the idea. Um, so let me show you a demo. This is Python. So <laughs> I have some rotation issues and whatever, but uh, you can do <laughs> you can do some uh, color matching and or you can you can fade colors in and stuff on the on the body parts, so you don't have to have complete separate images for that. Um, let me go back to spine here. I'll show you uh, an actual animation that I did myself. This is Spine Boy. He oh, that's not good. Not my software, <laughs> and it's written in Java. So let me open that back up. Oops. Takes a second. Java. <laughs> okay, so I, I made a little animation with uh, Inkscape. Um, show you. Let's see here. Called it Sword. So this is Sword, and I'll switch to animation mode. And set my start and my end. And repeat. Play. So, gives you an idea. I did this in like two, an hour, two hours. I was just playing with Inkscape and, and Spine, so really easy to get stuff set up. Um, let me show you what I did with that. So this is another example. Obviously, I need to fix my rotation issues. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the cool thing about this is you can actually do mixing on the animation. So you make Spine Boy uh, like run it, or, like walk and jump, and it'll mix the two animations together. Um, you can also do things procedurally. So really interesting stuff. Um, as soon as I get it uh, finished, um, I will put it on PyPy. It's already in GitHub. And uh, we have a, an, an open space tonight at 7 uh, in room 201, I think. So come check it out. Thank you very much. What's name again? Thank you very much, Terry Simmons. Okay, so there are more lightning talks here at 8.30 in the morning. Lots of things going on this evening. Some of them, I understand, even involving alcohol. So have a good, safe time. Remember the 3 two, one rule. Three hours of sleep, two square meals, and one shower every day. You are, you are allowed to skip something, but not the shower. <laughs> Okay, thanks for listening. One more round of applause for all our speakers, please. And there'll be more lightning talks at 8.30 in the morning. Good night. <laughs>